Session 10, Contradictions of Atheism. Our opening hymn is Praise to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, grant us a spirit of wisdom and insight to know you clearly. Enlighten our innermost vision, that we may know the great hope to which you have called us, the wealth of your glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the Church, and the immeasurable scope of of your power in us who believe. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the irreligious and perverse spirit of men who, in this perversity of theirs, hinder the truth. In fact, whatever can be known about God is clear to them. He himself made it so. Since the creation of the world, invisible realities, God's eternal power and divinity, have become visible, recognized through the things he has made. Therefore these men are inexcusable. They certainly had knowledge of God, yet they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. They stultified themselves through speculating to no purpose, and their senseless hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but turned into fools instead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Paul uses harsh words in this letter to the Romans 
for those who deny the existence of God. The subject today is the contradictions of atheism. The atheist believes that God does not exist. He explicitly rejects the intimate and vital bond between God and humans. Some atheists are materialists, restricting their needs and aspirations to this world. Others are humanists, looking only for social and economic liberation. Atheism is often based on a false idea of human autonomy, exaggerated to the point of refusing any dependence upon God. An agnostic does not necessarily deny God's existence, but he does not perceive God's intimate and vital bond with humans. The Contradictions of Atheism Ever since people have been able to think, they have given two different accounts of what the universe really is and how it came to be. First, the religious account. A theist, one who believes in God, believes that there is something behind or beyond or outside the universe which made the universe. It is more like a mind than anything else. That is, it is conscious and it has purposes and preferences. In fact, it is more like someone than something. We call it God. Second, there is the atheist account. An atheist believes that there is no God, and this also is a belief. An atheist is perforce a materialist, or more precisely, a naturalist. He believes that the ultimate fact, the thing you cannot go behind or beyond or outside, is the universe, a vast process in space and time which is going on, and always has gone on, he thinks, of its own accord with nothing outside it. If a naturalist has to account for a thing or an event in the universe, he does so by referring to other things and events in the universe, not to anything outside. Everything, he thinks, can be observed, studied, and in principle perfectly understood by the methods of science. But all things and events in the universe fall into patterns that give rise to what we call cause and effect. How do we decide? Now you'll notice that a lot of these footnotes are quite long. They're not just um, citing where we got these ideas from, they're adding to them because there is so much more to be added to these ideas which we don't have time uh, to put in or cause or reason to put in, I should say. But you might like to read all of them. How do we decide which account is true, the theists or the atheists? We cannot decide by scientific methods, for modern science is concerned only with things in the universe that can be observed by means of the five senses, and with ideas that can be deduced from observations and checked against other observations. If there is anything behind the universe, science cannot reveal it. We will have to remain ignorant of it or discover it in some other way. And C.S. Lewis, I am going to read this footnote. C.S. Lewis says, supposing science ever became so complete that it knew every single thing in the whole universe. Is it not plain that the question, why is there a universe? Why does it go on as it does? Has it any meaning? Would remain just as they were. There's a limit to what science can do, acknowledged by scientists. Now, many people think that the religious and the atheist accounts of the universe are equally valid. They think that God is an optional extra, 
You can believe in him if you like, they say, but we can settle the practical problems of everyday life without him. Even religious people have become imbued with this idea. That is why some Catholic politicians promise not to let their religion influence their vote. And it's worth reading um, footnote 10. I'm just going to read part of it. The, the American idea, the American Constitution, which provides for the separation of church and state, is not what we're talking about here. The intention of those who passed that amendment was to ban religion, not God, from government, not society. In fact, the original 13 colonies were founded by very religious people, not necessarily Christian, but certainly religious. So if, you, if this, in, if this um, idea concerns you, read footnote 10. But people who think that it doesn't really matter whether you accept the theist or the atheist account, some of them promise not to let religion influence their vote. Again, some parents leave it to their children to find out about God on their own and believe in him if they want to, as if he is an optional extra. In this talk, we want to show that the atheist view of the universe is not viable, for it cannot, even in principle, account for two phenomena we are all familiar with. One is our sense of right and wrong, and another is our ability to reach truth by reasoning. Now, there are others which we've outlined in footnote 11, but these are the only two we're going to tackle. And it's a well-known principle as a math teacher, I can tell you. If you're trying to prove that something is not true, all you have to come up with is one example. That's enough to prove it's not yes, true. Yes, for instance, if you wrote me a check and you didn't sign it, it doesn't matter whether you've got the right date or the right <laughs> amount or any other details. If there's any aspect missing, so to speak. Yeah, not quite the same thing, but Principle, yeah, yeah, it's true. Atheism's inability to account for the second, that is our ability to reach truth by reasoning, especially makes it intellectually self-destructive and puts it right out of the question for thinking people. But let's tackle the easier one first. Our ability, our sense, I should say, of right and wrong. When the Russians invaded Ukraine in 2022, everyone said that what they were doing was wrong. From the heads of countries at the United Nations to people on the street all over the world. It's happened many times before. It happened in 1939 when the Germans marched into what was then Czechoslovakia. Now those who protested were not saying merely that they did not like the way Russia and Germany were behaving. They were appealing to a standard of behavior that they expected the Russians and the Germans to know and admit. Accordingly, both Putin in Russia and Hitler in Germany tried to justify their behavior by claiming that they were uniting the people who spoke their language. A similar thing happens in everyday life. When one person accuses another of jumping to the head of a line, the one who is accused hardly ever replies, why shouldn't I? Nearly always he tries to establish that he had just stepped out of the line for a moment and was simply resuming his place or that there is some special reason why he should go first. I had the rather embarrassing situation. Somebody I used to drive quite often to the bank and other appointments and other places for, um, for business reasons, because he was incapable of driving himself, he was elderly. But he'd just say, I'm just, I'm just excuse me, I'm just, I've just got a, a quick message, and just push his way through. And I said, it's, it's not fair. Other people have business there as well. Oh, it's, yeah, but I'm, mine is just short. <laughs> it reminds me of a student I had many years ago. Um, I gave them a deadline by which a certain lab report had to be in, and they needed my initials on it to make sure it was perfect. And so I had quite a fairly long lineup 
of students waiting to get my initials on their laps. And one of these students came in, saw the lineup, and came up to me and said, just sign here. I said, no, I haven't seen your lab report yet. Well, just look, it's only this. I said, no, everybody else has got the same sort of question. Go to the back of the line. No, no, mine's very quick. I said, no. Well, he persisted to the point where I did something I have never done I had never done before and I've never done since. I took his lab report and I tore it in two and threw it on the floor and said, now get to the back of the line. So he went and picked it up. He said, now what do I do? I said, now you find some tape and you tape it back together again and then you go to the back of the line. So he got some tape and he taped it up again and then he came back to the front of the line. I couldn't believe it and neither could the other students. And at this, there was a huge uproar. And I said, if you don't go to the back of the line, I'm not going to sign it at all. It was almost unbelievable. Some but people have a tremendous nerve. He, yeah, but nearly always, as we say, somebody in this position tries to establish that they have a right to do what they're doing. In most cases then, it looks as though both the accuser and the accused have in mind some law or rule or code of conduct about which they agree. That is why they quarrel. They each try to show that the other is in the wrong. And that would be impossible if they did not agree about what constitutes wrong. It would be like trying to establish whether or not a soccer player had committed a foul when there is no agreement about the rules of soccer. I'm just, just going to move the posts just a little bit because... <laughs> The law to which accuser and accused both normally appeal used to be called the law of nature because people thought that everyone knew it by nature without being taught. They knew that you might find the odd person who did not know it, like a person who was colorblind or tone deaf, but they thought that on the whole, the human idea of right and wrong was obvious to everyone. So to sum up, people in all times and places have appealed to a law of right and wrong that they think everybody knows, even if they themselves do not, in fact, obey it. And we all fail sometimes, God forgive us. They know the law of nature, they break it, says C.S. Lewis. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. Now, people have tried to explain our sense of right and wrong in various ways. That's what we're going to consider. Some people think that it is just an instinct, like mother love, or the sexual instinct, or the fighting instinct, or the instinct for food, or the instinct for self-preservation. Now, when we are prompted by instinct, we feel a strong urge or desire to act in a certain way. For example, if we hear a cry for help from a drowning man, we probably feel two instinctive urges, one, to give help, and two, to stay out of danger. Either may be stronger. But quite apart from these, we are conscious of a third thing, which tells us to follow the instinct to give help and suppress the instinct to run away even if the urge to stay out of danger is stronger. We can be very sympathetic. That third thing is our sense of right and wrong. Now, our sense of right and wrong is different from an instinct in two ways. First, instincts point to what we want to do, while our sense of right and wrong points to what we ought to do. Our sense of right and wrong judges between instincts and tells us which instinct to encourage. Second, instincts always urge the same kind of behavior, while our sense of right and wrong does not. For example, the instinct of self-preservation always urges us to save our lives. The sexual instinct always urges us to gratify our sexual desire. But our sense of right and wrong tells a civilian to suppress his fighting instinct and a soldier to follow it. 
It tells a man to gratify his sexual instinct with respect to his wife, but deny it with respect to other women. In some circumstances, a sense of right and wrong tells a mother to encourage her instinct to defend her child. In others, it tells her to suppress that instinct and report her child to the police. And how difficult it is, but nevertheless, we know what's right. Our sense of right and wrong cannot be just an instinct. Some people think that the law of right and wrong is just an arbitrary human convention, that is an artificial agreement, which could equally well be quite different. And these people, you may notice, they tend to say, I'm looking at footnote 13, they don't say right and wrong, they say appropriate and inappropriate. I don't think that really changes things much. But thinking that the law of right and wrong is just an arbitrary human agreement, they explain that that is why we have to be taught it. Now, some of the things we have to be taught are like this. For example, we all have to be taught to keep to the right on the road. But it could equally be the left, as it is in England. However, not everything we have to be taught is like that. We all have to be taught the multiplication table, but it is not something we have made up for ourselves. And we could not equally well say that two times three is five. We all have to be taught to brush our teeth, but it is not something that could just as well be left out of our education. But of course, but our teeth would decay. There are three reasons why right and wrong cannot be arbitrary human conventions. First, arbitrary conventions vary, like the conventions that surround the wearing of hats. I can remember when, um, as a long-time teacher, when boys first started wearing baseball caps, pretty well, 24 hours. And the question was, could they wear them in school? And it was a subject of a number of uh, of staff, uh, con staff meetings. And the attitude of some teachers was, everybody should know that boys do not wear their hats in summer. And I remember one day pointing out that Jews, for example, do wear their hats out of respect in the temple or in the synagogue. This is an arbitrary human convention. And if the convention in Canada is different from the convention in the countries these boys have come from, we'll have to teach them. But it is arbitrary. It's not a matter of ultimate right and wrong. Arbitrary conventions vary. However, as a matter of observable fact, the law of right and wrong has been very much the same in all times and places. The moral teachings of the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans are strikingly similar. It's interesting and how Lewis looked at all of these different... That's what's in yes. Appendix, yeah. um, Appendix, Appendix 1. one. Yes. Lewis looked up the laws of right and wrong in these various cultures, and we've just copied his work and put it in Appendix 1. You might like to read it. You'll see that people differ about whether you ought to consider everyone else before yourself, or just your own family, or just your fellow countrymen. But they've always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. They differ about how many wives you may have, but they've always agreed that you should not simply take any woman you like. Well, that's the first difference between the law of right and wrong, our sense of right and wrong, and arbitrary human conventions. The second, we cannot expel the law from our thought no matter how hard we try. We can banish certain aspects of it. For example, many people in our society have banished, thou shalt not commit adultery. But there are always aspects that we retain and expect other people to retain. For example, I knew a very honest man, father is now in charge of a parish, and occasionally he's also in charge of the, um, right now he has the duty of going to Lionsgate Hospital, if somebody needs him. So he has to keep his phone on at all times. 
So we'll just go on and hope he can rejoin us. For example, I knew a very honest man who believed that we are all free to choose our own values, our own ideas of right and wrong. But there is one law he thought everyone should observe. Namely, thou shalt respect everyone else's values. He obviously tried hard not to be negative or judgmental when he told me that his niece was married to another woman and that their two children were the result of artificial insemination with sperm from an unknown man. But he gave himself away by adding, at least they're not hurting anyone. It seems that there was another law he thought everyone should observe. Thou shalt not hurt anyone. Even people who maintain that all values are personal or relative usually have some things that they think absolutely wrong, like the destruction of the World Trade Center or the sexual abuse of children. Even when they argue that nothing is absolutely or objectively wrong, they ordinarily behave and talk as though some things are. In fact, those who hold that there are no absolute values insist that it is absolutely wrong to impose one's values on others. I understand that in prisons, Often when talking to somebody who is in for one crime or another would say, yeah, but I never did such and such. Yeah. You know, yeah. trying to justify it on the grounds. I remember um, a fellow staff member who used to hold, um, she had a, I think it was a philosophy club, but they used to meet at lunch times in a room just opposite mine across the hall. And the photocopier that we used was in there. So sometimes I just had to go in and do some photocopying. And one day I saw that she had written on the board, you are free to proclaim any value that you think is a value, but do it with respect. So one day when she was the only one in there, I said, you know, there's a bit of a contradiction there. You say that they can, they can write or pro proclaim any value they like, provided they do it with respect. So I said, you've got one absolute value, haven't you? Be respectful. So she thought about it for a minute. She said, oh, Maureen. The third point is that the very idea of inventing or choosing our own set of values, our own law of right and wrong, is inherently, intrinsically, I should say, self-contradictory. For when we have stepped outside all value systems in order to choose between them, what grounds can we have for thinking that one is better than another? Unless we speak from within a value system, we can only exalt the values we happen to like. Now, it's worth reading. It's too long to read right now, but it's worth reading footnote 16. No, the law of right and wrong is not something we invented and we cannot change it. We have to be taught it, but as Aristotle said, the aim of education and the moral values is to make us like and dislike what we already ought to like and dislike. Okay. Now, some people think that right and wrong are just more emphatic ways of saying likable and unlikable, or acceptable and unacceptable. That may be true by coincidence, but not all the time. Suppose one man gets to the theater first and takes the best seat, while another gets there after me and removes the coat I have put on the best seat to save it for myself. I dislike both actions, but I claim that the man who removed my coat did something wrong, while the other man did not. It's just inconvenient. Or suppose, well, they're equally inconvenient, yes. but one is wrong and the other is right. Yes. Or suppose one man accidentally trips me up, while a second tries to trip me up but fails. I dislike what the first man did much more, 
but I blame him much less than the second man. Or consider the status of a traitor. In a war, the officials of an enemy government may welcome his behavior, but they nevertheless despise him. They may like his behavior, they still say it's wrong. No, what we call right or wrong behavior in other people is not simply the behavior that we ourselves like or dislike. And it's pretty obvious that the right kind of behavior in ourselves is not simply what we like or what pays. Finally, I think I've exhausted all the explanations. Finally, some people say that nature has conditioned us to call it right, to keep promises, help our neighbors, etc., because this is the kind of behavior that will ultimately preserve the human race. As evidence, they point out that with this idea of right and wrong, the human face has in fact survived. But we cannot attribute our survival to our sense of right and wrong, for in general, we have not kept the law. And what we think we ought to do is irrelevant to our survival if we do not actually do it. And just as an aside, does nature in fact want to preserve, preserve the human race? On the contrary, species seem to last for a while and then disappear like the dinosaurs and make way for others. Why should we prefer our own species to the one that will follow us if there is one? Anyway, that's just an aside. And does the rest of nature particularly want us to survive? <laughs> In any case, the law of right and wrong is not directed toward the preservation of the species. For example, it might command that an entire army submit to slaughter. And if the last woman left on earth after a nuclear war happened to be a nun, it would still dictate, thou shalt keep thy vows. Our sense of right and wrong then is not just instinct, convention, what we like, or what we will preserve, or what will preserve the human race. And if we treat it as if it is, we run into an insurmountable intellectual difficulty. Now what follows is more difficult intellectually than what we've just been saying. If it's too difficult, forget it. You don't have to understand it to be a good Catholic. If you can, it's worth considering. Consider a very simple, very formal example of reasoning. All chairs have seats. This object is a chair. Therefore, this object has a seat. Philosophers call this chain of reasoning a syllogism. The first two statements are the premises. The last one is the conclusion. Without premises, no reasoning is possible. We have to assume something to be true or nothing else can ever be known. Certain axioms have to be accepted as given. You may remember if you studied geometry in school, Euclid's geometry, how he started with, I think it's five axioms, things you simply have to see and accept before you can do any more geometry. Now notice that in the syllogism I gave you, all chairs have seats, this object is a chair, therefore this object has a seat. The premises are about fact. All chairs have seats, this object is a chair. And so is the conclusion. This object has a seat. Now it is a principle of logic that from factual premises, only factual conclusions can be drawn. It is logically impossible to draw a conclusion that commands something or describes what ought to happen. For example, consider the following. 
Dropping bombs kills people. This object is a bomb. Therefore, you ought not to drop this object. That is an invalid syllogism. Because while the premises are about what is, dropping bombs kills people, this object is a bomb, the conclusion is about what should be. Anyone who wants to draw this conclusion has to smuggle in the additional premise, you ought not to kill people, which is not about fact, but about ethics or morals or right and wrong. Atheists argue illogically in just this way when they claim that the law of right and wrong, which tells us what we ought to do, is derived from instinct, which tells us what we want to do, or convention, which tells us what everybody does do. For example, instinct supplies premises like, I want to stay alive. Convention supplies premises like, everybody tells lies. But for me to conclude that I ought to act so as to stay alive, or that I ought to tell a lie, I would need the additional ethical premise, I ought to do what I want, or I ought to do what everybody else does. We often try and justify, <laughs> not with honesty, but dishonestly, well, everybody else is doing it, as if that has anything to do it's with certainly not what logical. we thought. Yeah. Yeah. Without ethical premises, no ethical conclusions are possible. If you start ethically with a blank slate, you end ethically with a blank slate. Anything else is logically an impossibility. As in factual reasoning, there are certain ethical axioms that must be accepted as given. Now, atheists account for the moral axioms by saying that they developed naturally, like our instincts. Now, our instincts develop, scientists tell us, by a process of elimination. For example, any individual, race, or species that did not possess the fighting instinct would never fight and would be wiped out by those who did possess it. Any that did not possess a sexual instinct would never reproduce and would soon vanish. But the moral axioms cannot have developed in this way. Only our actual behavior, like fighting and reproducing, can have influenced our survival. The moral law, which describes how we should have behaved but often did not, cannot have had anything to do with it. Unlike atheists, who account for everything in the universe by referring only to other things and events in the universe, Catholics believe that there is someone outside the universe, God, who made all that is, visible and invisible. And Catholics say that the moral axioms are reflections of God's nature, divine nature, which God implanted in our minds from the very beginning because he planned to make us divine. However, when Adam and Eve fell, our wills became perverted and our reason obscured. In our fallen state, we needed to be reminded of the law and have it fully explained to us. Accordingly, God gave us reminders of the moral axioms. We call them the Ten Commandments. God wrote on the tablets of the law what men did not read in their hearts, St. Augustine said. So this very idea, which we cannot banish, which nobody can banish, no matter how hard they try, that we have a sense, our sense of right and wrong, must have come from outside the universe. It cannot have just been something we developed. But this and, is hard. And without going through all these different steps of logic, by and large, most of the time we all accept them in, in our daily lives. And we accept them. a sense of right and wrong, but a lot of people don't realize that that can't be logically accounted for except by God. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the point yeah. we're trying yeah. to make here. Yeah. Yes, everybody accepts At some least, idea, yes. some sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. 
but they don't all think this must have come from God. They think, oh, this just developed. This is an instinct. This is what preserves the human race. But I think we've tried anyway to demolish all those arguments. Yeah. It must have come from outside the universe. There must be something outside. It's funny how even little children very quickly have a real sense of right and wrong mm -hmm. and injustice, yeah. especially sometimes when they see injustice done to a friend, mm -hmm. one of their friends. It's that's just no. But again, that's again, everybody and that fit footnote sixteen that I suggested you read. We all have a sense of right and wrong. We don't all agree about what's right and what's wrong, but we all have a sense of right and wrong. Yeah. And it's important to realize that you can't logically think that that has come from within the universe. It's come from outside. That's the point. So let's yeah. take a break. We probably need a long break after that. The next part's even intellectually more difficult. <laughs> okay. So I hope we've convinced you. We've tried to put it as cogently as we can. Our sense of right and wrong is compelling evidence that the atheistic, materialistic, naturalistic view of the universe is untrue. Now let's consider our ability to discover truth by reasoning. Now, this is not intellectually easy to follow, but a lot of people can follow it. C.S. Lewis spent a lot of time in a lot of his books making this point. And we spent, we know it's not easy to present or to realize the first time you see it. And we spent hours and hours and hours over men, months and months trying to put this as clearly as we could. If it doesn't make sense to you, forget it. There are only two things in the universe which we can know directly. Our own sensations, like pain, hunger, heat, and cold. And our own emotions, like anger, joy, fear, and regret. Anything else we know, we know indirectly. For example, when I claim to know Father Vince, I mean that a certain idea or image of him is present in my mind. He is not present in my mind. But the idea is. The idea. It is by means of that idea or image that I know him. The ideas and images that we have of everything outside ourselves are inferred or deduced from our sensations and emotions by reasoning or rational thinking. It is by reason that we see or grasp or apprehend or comprehend or know or understand anything other than our own sensations and emotions. Things like, you are sitting there, or nine sevens are 63, or Mount Everest is higher than Grouse Mountain, or Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in 1953. I don't know if this helps, but if you've ever seen, if you've ever become familiar with a newborn baby, Sometimes people say newborn babies can't see, but there's nothing wrong with their eyes. Their eyelids are open, their corneas are clear, the light gets through, it gets focused, it gets onto the, onto the retina. But if you've ever watched a child develop, you realize that there comes a point when they focus, when they reach out their hand, and the sensation of touching something and the sensation of seeing suddenly become related to something out there. And it happens very early. Fairly early, but yeah. you can see that mm -hmm. you can, yes. you can, there are days when you can't see it. If you've ever watched the movie um, of Helen Keller. I the Miracle Worker. The Miracle Worker. Yeah. Helen knew how to, understand, she knew how to receive the messages tapped into her finger. She was deaf and blind from very early on. She, her teacher taught her to under, not to understand, that's not to the word. To communicate. A teacher told her how, what the language meant. But at the very end of the movie, it's only at the very end that she suddenly realizes that this corresponds to 
water which she can feel pumping over her hand. And the thrill of relating it. And then she suddenly realized that everything else her teacher has tapped into her hand has an outside reality. That, it took years for Helen because she was deaf and blind. It takes even days or weeks, I don't know which, for a newborn baby. I'd but I've seen weeks. the difference. Yes. I have seven younger siblings and I've seen it happen. So that, that was all directed towards establishing that the ideas and Im images that we have of everything outside ourselves are deduced from our sensations and emotions by reasoning or rational thinking. Put it um, another way, just imagine seeing a page of Chinese writing means absolutely we, nothing to us. But with Right. Or I remember a priest saying that when he was studying in Rome, he knew no Italian. So he started going to bed with a radio under his pillow, speaking Italian. And one day he found he could understand it. The sounds in his mind suddenly corresponded to something out there. Mm. And this happens by reasoning. Now, the classic example of reasoning is... Victor Borga, by the way, with who God says that... He could only understand, speak Italian when he was asleep. Japanese, yeah. <laughs> oh, Japanese in that case, yes. The classic example of reasoning is the syllogism. But reasoning is hardly ever that formal or conscious. St. Thomas Aquinas said that to reason is simply to advance from one thing that is understood to another. Just to advance. St. John Henry Newman said that reason is the faculty of gaining knowledge without direct perception or of ascertaining one thing by means of another. I love those definitions. Yeah. In ordinary everyday reasoning, and this is something everybody does, we pass from one point to another in various ways, by a mere indication, by what seems probable, or by an association in our minds. Then perhaps we fall back on experience, or the testimony of someone we trust, or a popular impression, or some inward instinct, or some obscure memory. How we reason is a mystery. Think about the last time you jumped to the conclusion that someone was dishonest, or pleased, or unhappy. Think of the many subtle symptoms in his manner, voice, accent, by which I mean tone of voice, not, not accent in English. In his manner, voice, tone of voice, words, appearance, or silence, which your mind felt and analyzed almost unconsciously. Think of how much you deduced and how quickly. Then think of how difficult it would be to justify your conclusion. Good example would be that if I just looked at you and said, hmm? Or wouldn't even have to do that. Even just the slightest frown, you would think, oh, you don't get that, do you? Mm -hmm. you yep. You'd know so much from the smallest indication. Yeah. And we all reason like this all the time. Most people wouldn't call it reasoning. They think of reasoning as something much more formal and difficult. But this is reasoning, passing from one thing which is known to another. Whether we are geniuses or mentally handicapped, whether we can analyze what we are doing or not, we all have what I think it's St. John Henry Newman called this living, spontaneous energy within us. Yes. So to sum up, my idea of anything outside myself is inferred or deduced by reasoning, from the sensations and emotions it causes in me. Mm. Now, my idea of anything outside myself is true insofar as it corresponds to the thing itself. Insofar as it is merely caused, rather than being inferred by reasoning, we do not call it true. Now, that paragraph is important, but difficult to follow. It sounds complicated, but it's a principle we all use all the time. For example, 
In a story by Agatha Christie, Mrs. McGillicuddy wakes from a nap on a long train journey, sees a woman being strangled in a train that is passing on a parallel track, and summons the conductor. The man looks at her doubtfully. Then he catches a glimpse of a picture in her magazine showing a girl being strangled. And he says, now don't you think, madam, that you've been reading an exciting story and that you just dropped off and are waking a little confused? Why does the conductor think that Mrs. McGillicuddy's story is not true? Because he thinks that it is fully accounted for, caused, in fact, by her reading material and her nap. For another example, take the suggestion that the idea of God can be fully accounted for, that it's actually caused by a gene that some of us inherit and others do not. This was an idea that was bandied around a few years ago. If that were the case, then we would rightly discount the idea of God as having no truth in it. As an analogy, imagine hearing a ringing in your ears. If it can be fully accounted for by the loud dance music the night before, we say that you are not really hearing, that is, you are not hearing the outside world. Real hearing is what is left when you have discounted the effect of the loud dance music on the auditory nerves. Similarly, Real thinking about the outside world is what is left when you have discounted the effect of the nap or the reading material or the gene. However, according to an atheist, you cannot discount this effect. For, he thinks, the nap, the reading material or the gene actually causes my mental idea of anything outside myself. Remember, an atheist regards my ideas as simply things or events in the universe, related to all other things and events in the universe by what we call cause and effect. On these grounds, an atheist can say, you think God exists because you were brought up that way. And that brings back to my mind. Do you remember when we were picking up books for our library um, at, at the border mail before COVID? And we had to undo all the books because we were going to take them across the border. So we had to take them out of their wrappings. And there was a man there who realized that, well, Father was dressed as a priest, but all the books we were ordering were Catholic books. And he said, are you guys Catholic? And we said, yes. And we explained that we were buying these for our course. A few weeks later, I met him in West Vancouver. And he said, have you been a Catholic all your life? And I said, yes. Oh, that's why you believe it. You were taught it by your parents. He thought my, the teaching by my parents had caused my Catholicism. Now, if I had had my wits about me, which I didn't at the time, I would have said to him, do you clean your teeth? He probably would have said, yes. Have you been doing it all your life? Yes. Oh, that's why you do it. Because your parents taught you to. And he would have said, no, I see the benefits of doing it. You can see the difference. Well, you see the truth. Well, you see the difference yes. between what is caused and what is done by yeah. reasoning. Yeah. Of course, an atheist could equally well say, you think Shakespeare is a genius because you are English. Or you think two plus two equals four because you are a mathematician. So I can discount that. Therefore, two and two may not be four. <laughs> but here's the conclusion. If thought can be fully accounted for, that is, if it is actually caused in this way, then all thought can be considered to be tainted at the source. All our reasoning is discredited. There is no real thinking. What happens in our brains when we think, according to an atheist, is caused by something else in the universe. But, and here is where an atheist's thought destroys itself, it is his own reasoning that has produced his naturalistic, materialistic view of the universe. 
in claiming that his view of the universe is true, he implies that his own reasoning has led him to the truth about the universe. But the truth he has reached discredits the reasoning that produced it. If my reasoning is simply the way in which my conditioning makes me feel, then I cannot trust my mind when it tells me about the universe any more than a man can trust his ears the morning after the loud dance music. An atheist says, I will prove that what you call a proof is only the result of mental habits that result from heredity, which results from biochemistry. But if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but that does not make them sound logically. And hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. This, believe it or not, is a quotation from J.B.S. Haldane, who was a self-proclaimed atheist. I don't know if he ever changed his mind. Yet he'd come to the truth in it. You think so? At least part of it. Yeah. If, and these are all attempts to say the same difficult thing in, in different ways, if thought is just electric currents or chemical changes in the brain, we cannot call any thought true or false. For there is no sense in which these words can be used about electric currents or chemical changes. Atheism says, in effect, I will prove that proofs are non-rational. Or more succinctly, I will prove that there are no proofs. <laughs> Atheism cannot be true, for it saws off the branch it sits on, discredits the process by which it is arrived at. We must, on pain of idiocy, admit that in reasoning, the process by which we determine truth and falsehood, there is something from outside the universe. Now, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you may like to stop and read that all again. <laughs> it's not easy to follow. It's not easy to, even when you follow it, it's not easy to explain. And reproduce. Certainly to reproduce, yeah. For a Catholic, reason, which is an attribute of God, is older than the universe. God made the universe. When he made humans, he made us in his image, giving us something of his own power to reason. When we reason, he frees us from non-rational cause and effect, as far as is necessary for us to know truth. When we say that we know something about an object, that we, uh, when, we know some, when we say that we know something about an object we are contemplating, we claim that we are perceiving the truth about it. If we are, then our thought must have broken free from the universal chain of cause and effect. The result, the idea in our mind, must be related to what we are contemplating, the outside thing, by reason, at least to some extent. It cannot be merely a particular effect of that total and largely mindless system of things and events that we call the universe. Difficult to follow, but as I say, it's not just our idea. Lewis came up with it and quoted other people. So in conclusion, perhaps the conclusion will make more sense than the arguments, our sense of right and wrong and our ability to discover truth by reasoning are, if you understand them, compelling evidence that the universe is not all there is. There is something or someone outside. Can we perform a scientific experiment to see whether humans can really tell right from wrong and truth from falsehood? The answer is no. For science, modern science anyway, depends on observation. I remember one of the early cosmonauts when he came back to Earth 
who and, expected to find God out in space. And he space. said, I found no sign of God in right. space. Yeah. No. And that, that comes, that's a good example. We'll come back to it lo- yeah. later on. We can't perform a scientific experiment to see whether humans can really tell right from wrong and truth from falsehood. To understand this, observe worms. You will soon see that they move away from the light. That's an observation. But is it because they consider this the right thing to do? Is it become the light is it because the light forces them to move away? Does the light account for their behavior completely? You cannot tell. You can only observe what worms do. Similarly, no observation of humans can discover whether we really have the abilities we claim, the abilities to determine right and wrong and truth and falsehood. Fortunately, there is one thing, only one, in the whole universe about which I know more than science can discover, and that is myself. I do not merely observe myself from the outside as I observe everything else. I am myself. I know myself directly from the inside. I have inside information. I am in the know. And every human being can say the same. I know that I have two abilities which no one studying me from the outside could ever see. Two abilities which free me from or raise me above the observable cause and effect universe. One is my ability to know the truth, that which is. And the second is my ability to know the good, that which ought to be. Both, as we have seen, both these abilities imply that the universe cannot be all there is. My position then is this. There is only one case in which I can even expect to know whether there is anything outside or behind or beyond the universe or above, namely the case of myself. And in that one case, I find that there is. Alternatively, put it a different way, if there is a controlling power outside the universe, I cannot expect it to show itself to me as one of the observable facts inside the universe any more than I could expect the architect of a house to be a wall or a staircase in the house. The only way in which I can expect it to show itself is by direct communication inside myself as a light showing me the truth, for example, or as an influence or command trying to get me to behave in a certain way. And that is just what I do find. Is there anything outside the universe? In the only case where I can expect to get an answer, the answer turns out to be yes. Now, it's not... Intellectually, this is not a difficult, it's not an easy, I should say, it is a difficult talk. But I often used to do, um, when I was teaching physics, I would often do problems, ostensibly for the whole class, difficult ones, knowing that perhaps 5% of my students could follow me. But I thought, at least the others can see that they can follow it. In other words, it would put them in a position where they could say, I don't know the answer to this question, but I know that there is one. And I think that's sometimes almost as important. This is not a problem I can solve, but I know there is a solution. I know, as an electrician, when studying in technical, in in trade school, that there were aspects of the... um, electrical industry that I didn't understand. But there were other students who did and could have put it into practice and utilize what they had had understood. And I could see the results of it. And and I didn't itself, understand how or quite why. I could get inklings, but mm-hmm. that's all. But that but the evidence that other students did understand it is yes. itself evidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Appendix 1 is the one we referred to, um, Lewis's from The Abolition of Man, The Law of Right and Wrong, to show you how similar these laws have been in every society. Appendix 2 is also from Lewis, Outside, Inside versus Outside Information. Very interesting story. Again, do you look at something from the outside or you, do you get inside and look at it? As we said, there is one example in the universe where we are inside, and that is ourselves. The rest of it you have to look at from the outside, which is the more valid view. Worth reading, if you like reading. So what are we reading? So going back to the Bible reading for this coming week, we'd encourage you to continue on reading the second book of Samuel, chapters 15 to 24. And in this reading, you'll see how David took a census of the people and he found approximately 1.3 million men fit for military service. In itself, counting people is not wrong. However, David displeased God for his census showed that he was relying on his warriors rather than on God. Next week, we will see that there is indeed a place for science in the Catholic faith. Science is good. It's part of the domain over the earth, dominion. the dominion of the earth that God gave Adam and Eve. We should know what we're doing, what the world is like around us. However, we must never forget that it is God who not only creates all things, but also, and at every moment, upholds and sustains them in being, enables them to act, and brings them to their final end. It is he whom we must thank for everything, as David says in his final song of thanksgiving. And in the meantime, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.